Hello, everybody. It's Sara Oblak Spiker here, sharing with you another hour or so, 45 minutes of an interview that, in conversation, actually, I should say, that I know will be amazing. It will be rich, it will be uh, deep. And uh, I am so excited to welcome my dear friend Yulika. Hi, how are you? I'm great. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me, Sarah. Oh, my pleasure. You know, I've been meaning to reach out to you and have this conversation for quite some time now. And uh, to give a little bit of a context, you and I have met now almost 10 years ago. We were both moms in um, networking worlds. <laughs> um, we have shared many amazing experiences with the kids. Uh, we are both Europeans and uh, we both are really passionate about where we are right now as a society and where we are going. And I know the work that you're doing is profound. So I wanted to perhaps just open this conversation by diving right in. What we're experiencing in the society, whether it's the US or pretty much worldwide, it's not from today to tomorrow. It has been bubbling to the surface for centuries, the inequality, the disparities, whether it's racial or how the wealth has been divided. Um, you are a mother also of biracial children. So this is really personal to you on so many different levels. So um, let's just start right there. What comes up? Um, where do you want to take this? Okay, great. So thank you. I think I'm going to start kind of how I'm finding myself at this place. Um, you know, when we met, I was working for an organization that was working towards ending gender based violence. And in this process, we were, you know, doing a lot of education around the power dynamics in relationships. And what I found out was that we have these expectations for you know, adult relationships, but not necessarily for, for the relationships that we have with our children. So I found that we are basically educating on how, not to, how to have healthy relationships with adults, which means that we don't manipulate, we don't use tactics of power and coercion and so forth. And yet we're doing the exact same thing with our children. We are using our po power over our children to get them to do what we want them to do because we're the adult and we make the decisions. And, um, and that was not an approach that I was comfortable with. And it sort of set me on a search to find out better ways. And long story short, I you know learned about peaceful parenting and I realized there are whole bookshelves full of parenting books. And because I had a commute, I was able to listen to books um, for quite some time every day. And so really, I like to say commuted myself into a new job <laughs> um, and really eventually went through some training and you know, to cut to the chase, became a parenting educator. And I've been working in that field for um, the last five years and really, or taking the time before. So the last seven to five years and um, learned a lot of course, and also really, became aware of the fact that even with all the awesome parenting tools that I have for my children um, and that we have at our disposal and what I know about child development and positive mindsets and you know having a growth mindset etc I realized that it's not just me it's really how I'm made up so my past really shows up in my conversations with my children and my confrontations with my children. Um, the parts that I didn't have that I really needed that I was trying to get my, to my children, um, I couldn't provide. So I basically learned about adverse childhood experiences in the process as I was trying to um, better understand what was really going on. And um, maybe you can link um, some information that I'll provide for you that folks can li link to. But really what that study showed about 20 years ago is that there is a direct correlation between the amount of adversity that we experience in childhood on our long-term health and well-being. 
And so, um, and it asks specific questions that are more around family, centered around families. But when you think that through and you really try to understand um, why families don't have, let's say, um, the, why families experience high levels of stress, right? Then you can look at, okay, so what does the environment look like? And then you ask, why does the environment look like that? And so ultimately, it really leads us to the systemic issues that we're facing today, that we're grappling with. So this really goes back to colonialism um, and you know, the way we've shaped capitalism in, in a way um, that you know, really requires to have this kind of multi-tier or classist system, which also is expressed in the caste system and so that's, you know, whether wherever we fall in that um, class or caste, it really still affects all of us. And so that's what I, what brought me into community activism and organizing and so forth. So, you know, that's how I am currently very active in um, efforts to build anti-racist structures in our community. Um, you know, through diversity committees and diversity, equity, and inclusion in our school districts, um, as well as in, you know, all of the kind of pieces that come together that we live in. You know, if you see yourself sort of the individual at the center, right, and then it, it really goes out in the social ecological way and how we're all inter intertwined with our families, with our communities, with the broader communities and the institutions that operate in them, our governments and you know, ultimately the world. And so this is um, very much, I've been uh, working and I teach about um, resilience and how to build resilience. And that's what, where it shows that it's not a do-it-yourself project and neither is parenting. You know, We talk about the village, but that's sort of a, a you a, a euphemism right for something that we sometimes think we have lost but really it's about the structures and the factors that are present in all of these different realms that support our ability to nurture resilience in the individuals right and otherwise it's debilitated and that's what has this you know havoc really wreaks havoc on our health and well-being as we can see in the outcomes you know, related to the pandemic, um, folks who experience the most impact are usually um, you know, people of color, black people, indigenous people. And so, yeah. There are so many different directions we can take this conversation and uh, I apologize for the noise in the background. <laughs> um, I was listening to an interview yesterday, actually, um, and Dr. Michael Eric Dyson was talking about how deeply rooted the systemic racism is, that it came to the point it doesn't really matter of who the person in charge is anymore. It's going to come through anyway, and they will continuously perpetuate because there's just a lack of awareness of what does that even look like. Because we, you know, I mean, one of the things that I know has been really challenging for me over the past couple of years in particular is both you and I have European background. You're from Germany, I'm from Slovenia. So in so many ways, we might not have been affected directly with what has been going on in the States. That doesn't still excuse us from participating and just like you are doing on so many levels with the resilience building and being an educator and being a community organizer um, from educating and really going to the roots because I, I want to ask you actually, where is the personal responsibility on the, you know, individual level of, you know, be mindful of how you speak be aware of your biases mm -hmm. and where does where's the layer when we enter now into the systemic um racism that how do we fix it what are the steps what is the process and how long does it take right ha. don't we all wish we had a pill to just say here you go honey you know this is fixed and you know as people who are very capable we feel oftentimes Oh, let me fix this you know which is a whole other um conversation that we can have but 
really so let me just say that you know growing up in germany i felt the weight of history from a very early age and every time we left the country to go somewhere else i felt like oh i can leave this behind right and then you know i came here to the united states by way of living in south africa and in england and luckily i wasn't part of the so-called oppressors there right and then coming here you know well this is not my issue i'm german after all you know i'm not from here and you know then as you pointed out i am raising biracial children and um you know then i began to see that wait a minute there's more to this and so i dove into um really understanding the history and it became clear very quickly that the system, as you said, has been set up centuries ago in Europe, um, you know, and it's really has influenced and shaped every single structure that we have globally, including the structures that are basically so called alternatives right so we sometimes. Um, you know, refer to communism, but that's just still in the same conversation it's still in the same framework it's part of the same mechanism. So all of these structures have really been set up based on these, you know, white supremacist ideas on, you know, trying to explain race, trying to explain, um, you know, difference and, and giving higher levels of intelligence to, you know, the so-called superior races, et cetera. And so we, none of us can escape it. We all take responsibility in this. And we really have three choices. One is, and this is what Dr. Ibram Max Kendi talks about, um, you know, the one choice is we're basically racist or se segregationist, right? We say, you know, no, we're different. Um, we are assimilationists. That means we're trying to um, adjust to the white supremacist standards, right? So we, as individuals, try to um, achieve a certain level of accomplishments in order to be accepted into that category, right? Um, and the third one is that we have to be anti-racist. And, you know, in my view, really, there is no other choice than being anti-racist. And can we be all three of them? Sometimes we are actually, right? Even myself, I could be, um, you know, anti-racist in one moment and, you know, in a couple of hours or maybe three sentences down the line, I'm going to say something that is more assimilationist or segregationist. So it's really the individual responsibility lies in becoming aware and mindfulness and really practicing undoing our language. And it's a process of decolonizing ourselves, right? You see my pronouns here is she, they. You know, there's a, lie, a while ago that I um, decided I am way, way more than a woman. And putting me into that box basically makes me a uh, uh, doesn't allow parts of me to come alive that really are alive. It has less of a sexual connotation more than really an identity. And um, all of these aspects, so it's really this process of having to decolonize ourselves, undoing the language, undoing the thinking, undoing the acting, right? All of that goes together. And that's a deep process of transformation. And I see that we're really in it. I know I'm absolutely not the only one. There are so many of us who are deeply in it. You know, some of us have more words to put to it than others. But, um, you know, I see that the requests and the desire is really everywhere. And it's intense, you know, and these changes that we go through, it physically, it has a physiological impact on us, right? And so I think the level of overwhelm and anxiety that a lot of people feel or this in intensity that folks are um, grappling with at the moment, is really a sign from, you know, when you want to, when you say, be the change you wish it to see in the world, right? So we're becoming some of that. And so, you know, the more um, conscious and aware we can be of these processes and really go through our feeling processes, I think is, is really important. I love how you brought in um, biology itself into the conversation because uh, Dr. Mate Gabor was speaking to how just stress itself impacts our health and longevity and how women of color in particular are expected to live seven to eight years less 
than white women because of that level of stress. And it's passed through generations because, of course, once it impacts chromosomes, that's what it gets passed on. So here's the epigenetics that comes into conversation as well, which is why this is a process that as much as some parts of the society is like, well, can't you just snap out of it? It's a past. Get on with the program. It's some of the most disheartening things you can say. Um, the process itself and um, I owe it to you when we first started to meet and I was a new mom and you were actually the one who introduced me to conscious parenting and I was like well what is this another kumbaya thing <laughs> <laughs> I did not expect it to change me so fundamentally and it goes down to the most messy the most um the darkest, the deepest corners of one's soul when you are really ready and willing to dig it up. And uh, like you said, just because, you know, your ancestors, there's a history with the oppressor during the Second World War, and here you are, generations later, still carrying this burden. Um, when we go back to the conversation of community organizing and building the resilience and the work that you're doing with the individuals who you're working with the families. Um, how does that impact communities at large, especially now that we're really seeing the impact that these disparities have brought? Mm -hmm. You know, how much has been, how much weight and the, how society has been dependent yes. on the members of a community that have gone um unright i don't want to say un yeah i guess you could use the word unrecognized or underappreciated and now that they're struggling the most and yet when we are fighting to bring them up to support them we are named oh you're a socialist you're a communist get out of here mm -hmm. uh we're not giving out handouts i mean we can talk for another five days just on that particular topic right yes yeah, and really to say, you know, this is this crux that we often get to, we feel like we have to um, lift people up or help people as opposed to recognizing the culture, the knowledge, the wisdom, the, um, you know, skills and all of that that lies within the experiences of people who've experienced particular amounts of oppression, right? So we oftentimes think we, that's the idea of, you know, basically um, coming to this assimilation, right? To get to a certain standard as opposed to giving that value what is, right? And so, um, you know, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't care about proper housing conditions, et cetera, but it really means that we need to give value to the ways people express themselves, right? And so that's kind of what I'm exactly working on is that so on the individual level with families and individual parents and caregivers I work with, it's very much about validating their experiences um, and, and providing awareness and, um, and basically uh, information and education around the systemic parts that influence their personal experiences and then tools to um, you know, to really broaden the bandwidth, or to get to know, and then broaden your the bandwidth of every one of our individual resilient zones, right? And so, and when we talk about parenting, it's less about being a perfect parent, right? Whether you're this parenting style or that parenting style, we're all on a continuum somehow. It's a spectrum, but how do we get into the spectrum where we can be? in our resilient zone, which means that we can be responsive to our children's needs and really focus on developing healthy relationships with our children. Do we mess up? Yes. Do we yell at them? Yes. Do things happen? Yes. But how do we make up? How do we really teach our children how to get through this and develop, you know, these inner kind of skills and capacity and then, you know, really have that um, relationship that is built on trust and connection and um, love, of course, right? So all of that. And so then on the community level, what we need to work on as well is really um, the aspects that have to do with what kind of structures we need. So, 
um, you know, Dr. Sean Jinright talks about um, healing centered engagement. And this is kind of the trajectory where we're going from. The first step is really education about the impact of trauma on our health and well being. So, foundation, baseline, you get it, right? So, you understand there's a link. You understand it's not what's wrong with you, it's really what happened to you and what happened in your environment as a result of it, right? And then asking questions, what's strong with you, right? So where are we, Where? how do we build resilience? How can we nurture resilience and remove the factors in our communities that debilitate the ability to develop resilience, right? That get in the way of the positive parent-child relationship, for example, or whoever is, you know, the caregiver or the teachers or the bus drivers or the pediatrician or, you know, the judge in the court, you know, it's really in all these places. So it goes from being trauma-informed to resilience building and then to actively implement healing-centered approaches. And so that means this is where the decolonizing process starts for all of us, right? So we have this process where um, we basically, and this is what Dr. Shinran, uh, Dr. Sean Jinrai talks about, you know, we have to pivot or shift from having a lens to reflection, right? So, um, and I've, I've actually researched a number of um, indigenous epistemologies and what that means is how indigenous people accumulate knowledge and build knowledge, right? And so, we as Westerners have a certain way of, you know, building our logic and our epistemologies and they, are in for, they, they created all of our structures. So that also influences our thinking and how we problem solve. So how are we going to problem solve with the same mindset, the same thinking, the same structures, when we really want to not just um, reconstruct, but we need to build a new, you know, foundation. So. Uh, so in these epistemologies, right, there's different ways. So there's one step in this learning process that has to do with reflection. You look in the smoking mirrors and you see yourself, your reflection in the mirror. And in the background, you see the entire context, right? And so as you begin to, and it's actually the context of creation. This is how this is viewed, right? So in this, you see yourself where you fit into the context of how creation took place. And so from that process, you gain precious new knowledge. And it's not the kind of knowledge that then is, you know, this knowledge is power kind of thing, right? Even though, yes, it can be very empowering to know certain things, but it's really this knowledge that then drives internal transformation in the long term, right? And so this is why, you know, moving away from um, having a lens to really moving towards more of that mirror, that reflection. And another part is that, you know, is a lot of our relationships are transactional, right? I do this, it's tit for tat. You pay me, I do this, you know, this is how our system is built. And so we need to move into really understanding the quality of relationships and how to build and cultivate these relationships, how to build trust with one another, how to you know, have our social networks, et cetera, that, you know, we're exp expanding. And then, you know, we are very much, we talked about we're skilled people, we want to problem solve. So, you know, here's a problem, let's fix it. You know, I have the tools and it's not so much about that. It's really about envisioning possibility, right? Asking what else is possible. And, um, you know, that's, that's really kind of this, this process that we're looking in. And that leads us really away from this hustle that we're always in to more be in flow with what is needed and what is responsive. And so this is how we become human centered as opposed to being profit centered. And that's then what enables and ripples out into all of these circles that I mentioned um, to the individual to really be able to, you know, um, reduce stress, to um, engage with one another, to um, practice anti-racism, um, you know, on a daily basis, and really to begin to, because the human is centered, right? So mm -hmm. that's what it is. And that's where healing can take place. And that's how we also, you know, center the experiences that we've had as an experience but also as a potential for transformation. 
can we talk about um there's i can feel and it's been happening for decades now this profound shift where we are going from this piscean age archaic age literally into a new era of aquarian leadership where the old patriarchy structures are starting to crumble and everything is in a softer more feminine way if you want to speak through the lens of energy but how do we speak in a language of money and profits and in a language of how is it going to financially benefit a society because some in power would still argue that there's nothing wrong because the only thing they're looking at is, is p l statements for themselves and the big pharma and the food industry are some of the biggest offenders who are holding the reins so tightly because it benefits them so how can we unravel that from the inside out from the um bottom up so to speak um yeah. how do we get them on our side so it doesn't just be become a conversation or the consciousness and what is the right thing to do but it actually speaks to them in a the language that they will understand mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, you know, first of all, in terms of gender and moving towards, you know, a different approach, I think that is another um, expression of, of the limitations that were put on us by even giving us gender, right? And so it's really this decolonizing process also potentially takes away these, you know, by I mean, yes, in nature, you have gender to some degree, and that's how we procreate, and we can leave it at that. But in terms of the, um, you know, qualities that come along with that, I think there are a lot more qualities in all of us that are non-gendered, you know, or parts of all genders. So um, the conversation, I think, really is, um, has to keep in mind, you know, how we are, or what we're doing to keep us in the frameworks that we have created, right? Um, and then in terms of, you know, really getting to um, this transformation on, you know, an economic level, you know, honestly, I think we have very little time left. We have about one chance left if that. And that chance really means that we have to understand where capitalism leads and how it really destroys us. I am not saying I'm a communist. I'm not. I am not offering that because that's the same model. I think really where we need to move towards is a human and planet or earth-centered engagement with one another and the earth. And that is our last chance. Um, I don't know that we actually can make it <laughs> because as you say, these forces, the self-interest that are there are so very strong. Mm -hmm. um, they are you know, um, carefully crafted over such a long time and everyone is kind of in this mill that replicates it automatically whether they want it or not. And so it really takes that becoming conscious and aware and making the decision as a result of it to say, I no longer want to participate. And, you know, here I'm sitting and I am, you know, sipping my coffee from, I don't know, Ecuador maybe, or was it from Honduras? You know, um, did I look for the fair trade label? Yes, but, you know, I mean, this is just to calm my conscious. The fact of the matter is that I am still, whether I want it or not, participating in the system that sort of really leads to the, I think, you know, ultimately the potential for our own destruction. So um, the only way out I see is through transformation that starts with the individual and that then has to become really contagious and, and, and take over. And I mean, I am happy to say that I think there is a sufficient you know, number of um, efforts that really um, work towards that, but it's still, you know, who knows where we're going to go. So I've just definitely become a little bit disillusioned, um, but I do still have hope as well. <laughs> yeah. And the hope is 
just about the only thing we can retain in any time but uh, you know it's I think as parents it really hits us on a whole different level when we look around it's like what am I leaving behind for my child and uh, I want to talk to you about if we shift conversation just slightly um, the work that we were talking about is what you do professionally it's what you're passionate about I think it would be fair to say it's your life's work um, what are the conversations you're having with your children to um, perhaps explain to them in some ways they are experiencing on their own all these heart-wrenching things that many of us can't even identify with and I'm going to be really brutally honest I can't potentially say that I understand how it feels to be a person of color, that I understand how it feels to be a woman of color in this society, in this age. But how do you have conversations with them that empowers them, that gives them the tools that they will need, that acknowledges their experiences, and that also brings them on board so they continue this fight, they continue this legacy that you are building? Yeah, so those are deep questions and um, there's no easy answer to it. And I am just also, you know, trying. I don't have recipes in that sense. Um, I can share what I'm trying and that is sort of, you know, I've had very frank conversations about frank in terms of, you know, obviously age appropriate conversations with my children around what goes on in the world. Um, and in terms of, you know, or, or, or asking them questions that stimulate their critical thinking, right? So I'm trying to be cautious not to tell them all the things they should think, um, because, you know, that's so very easy to do. Um, I am really trying for them to ask them questions about how does that feel when you see something like that? What does that tell you about friendship? How do you... Um, you know, um, experience this and ask them questions to really become to first of all, broaden their own emotional or emotional vocabulary so that they can express themselves, but then really to be able to identify those. And yes, you get a lot of, oh, I don't know, you know, um, but it's, and it's not about having these conversations all the time. It's an ongoing dialogue that we have on all these topics, right? And all these topics, I'm talking about healthy relationships, um, racism in the world, about um, you know, forms of oppression and, um, you know, the environment. These are some of the ongoing conversations and they, you know, they grow with us. So I'm very impressed with their vocabulary, you know, not just my children's vocabulary, but just the Gen Z, right? They're so, I mean, with it, they have TikToks that they, um, you know, have that have certain names like a pick me TikTok, you know, that really shows you about dysfunctional ways of finding, you know, love in a way. And, and so it's really, they, they have um, ways and modes to express themselves and to connect with each other that we didn't have that really is um, powerful and gives them opportunity. And so we, I try to guide them around how to use these tools, right? So that it's not something that sucks you in all the time and that ends up controlling you. But so you have some control over the content you're searching, what you're interested in and that sort of thing. So and each of my children are very different and they have very different interests. And I try to support those and connect with them at that level. Um, you know, raising biracial children has definitely opened my eyes to um, the forms of discrimination that they're facing. And it's um, unimaginable, I think, for a lot of white folks um, to see what they really go through because so many of us say we're colorblind or, oh, well, this was in the past, you know, and um, where my children are growing up in a predominantly white school district, you know, they have definitely all experienced different forms of discrimination, racism, and comments. And, you know, from my oldest who's 16, you know, it's like, for example, um, you know, around dating, right? So, so many people are dating and somehow she's always the best friend, you know? So there's um, a lot of, um, 
really painful experiences or as a painful awakening to the injustices in our world. And witnessing that has been one of the most difficult parts about parenting in general. Um, I think, you know, you when children wake up to the world in general, but to for them to see up to to see how they are becoming aware of um, what the world values and what it doesn't. So my work is very much around um, strengthening their own self-esteem and knowing that these things exist in the world. It has nothing to do with you and who you inherently are and you know how you're valued. And so I see them standing up for themselves in awesome ways. Um, I also see my oldest in particular getting exhausted, educating her friends around issues um, and also taking a back seat and saying, I'm not talking to you about it. Go read somewhere else. It's not my job. Exactly. And, and it's, that's the thing. We are putting so much pressure and so much responsibility on them to educate us when it's our own. Be resourceful. Go out there. Ask questions. Read books. It's all out there. Don't put even more burden on somebody who already is traumatized. Right. Absolutely. And so the thing too is that, you know, their father has been more of an assimilationist in the way that he's pursued the to achieve the certain values that, you know, society has put on us. So his um, own connection to his culture and his background is not as valuable to him, which is what why he hasn't brought a lot of that to our children. And I think, you know, that's part of what I, where I feel too, I lack in really teaching my children black excellence, right? So how really to, to feel the um, connection to the culture and the traditions and the values and everything that comes from, you know, the cultures that they come from. And this is one of the things I've had plenty of conversations recently with um, friends who are from, you know, different parts of the world, specific, mostly black friends um, around exactly that, right? How can we get our kids together? So they feel strengthened, they see themselves and they um, really are connected to that sense of, you know, black excellence. Um, and, you know, I have to say that social media has been an awesome tool because my daughters have been able to, um, you know, follow people who have exactly their hair texture and what to do with it, who, you know, talk about the funny things in their families when they have, you know, parents from different cultural backgrounds and the things they say and, um, you know, sort of this living in between spaces and what that means. And that's been hugely valuable. And I really think that, um, you know, no matter where your children are from or what their background is, but validating their experiences and not saying, ah, it's not such a big deal or, ah, we don't talk about that. You know, that's what destroys, you know, their trust in the world and in themselves because what they perceive, it may be completely you know, um, or sometimes far from reality, right? Or from what most of us experience as reality, but that's their experience. So we have to validate that and really give voice to it. And then we can, you know, build them up or support and um, or learn from them, of course, you know, and, and I think that's, that's part, it's an ongoing process and I'm learning so much and, you know, I get why people say grandparent is parenting is great because you have now all this knowledge, you know, and experience and you can impart that to your grandchildren in a whole different way. It's with your children, you're still learning by doing, you know. So. Absolutely. And I think a lot of it also comes um, down to, again, personal responsibilities, because there's so much that they will not learn in school or they will only learn the feel good parts right but not the real ugly painful ones um i know i'm always my ears perk up when i overhear because my both of the kids are here at home at home distance learning and i'm listening into what they're learning and then in the afternoon go hey do you mind having a conversation because what you've heard is just a part of the story let's now sit down and take a look into the whole story 
Um, and I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised a couple of times when they brought the big issues up, like Holocaust, like racism. But still, it was scrubbed of this, like the essence. And especially what are the signs that um, we all have learned 2020 was eye opener for so many that, hey, yeah, it's all here. It's still here. It's still right underneath the surface. And the moment we choose to look away or close our eyes and close our ears and pretend it's not, it's, it's right here. Right, right. Yes. And I think one other part that I would add to that is that this work is not new, right? The work of liberation really is what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and we're talking about liberation for ourselves, for the world, for others, for all of us, right? And so this is not new. There's people, especially people who've been, you know, oppressed for one reason or another, have been fighting back for centuries. And we need to become aware that we stand on their shoulders. Yes. You know, we can really ground ourselves in the work that they have done. Yeah. And I think it's really important that we find that, that we find that connection because sometimes we, we get in our day and age, we get a little self-inflated, you know, about, ooh, all the great things that we do, but we're not recognizing and acknowledging yeah. where that comes from. And this is part of looking in the smoking mirrors, yeah. right? And this is really this process of seeing who's there you know, who wasn't there, who was missing, what was their, what, what were their experiences like, right? Yeah. And so I am so impressed um, with people, you know, whose work, um, you know, I feel like I can really begin to climb onto, right, and to join into the people, you know, thinking about Malcolm X, Angela Davis, you know, and I mean, of course, before then, you know, you talk about Ida B. Wells, or you know, Harriet Tubman and so many women in particular whose names we will never know, yeah. but who have really fought for, you know, equality even in indigenous movements, um, or not equality, really what they have fought for was, you know, liberation and the right to live. Yes. And, um, and so that's, I think, um, a really great way to also connect with our children and think about that and tell them, you know, to reassure them that, this has been a real issue. We're not the only ones trying to solve it, right? There have been people and we can continue that work. Exactly. Yulika, I would love to continue. I know our time is up for today, but thank you so much. Is there anything else you would like to add? And last but not least, how can people get in touch with you to continue this conversation to maybe bring you into their own organizations to do the work with their teams yeah so um i am i have a very strange relationship with social media which is why it's not always the best to connect with me there you can definitely find me on facebook and um, i'm sometimes active sometimes not um but i do really try to stay connected with my community so um, if, and if anyone is really interested, I would say contact you and, you know, then you can share my information, but my, I'm not unique. Um, I'm not in that way that you have community activists in your communities. And the key is really to connect with those people, broaden your circles, have conversations, cultivate your relationships, get on the ground, look who's around you. We're so, um, sometimes you know um drawn to connect in this in the um you know virtual world but really we need to be active in our communities in our backyards your children's schools your um you know whatever and it's not just volunteering it's really rolling up your hands and contributing to problem solving so yeah that's my <laughs> thank you yeah. It's true. It does start. Everything is right in front of our noses. So right. thank you so much. This was such a joy and pleasure and especially an honor.